down to that, right? That's the ultimate message is, is God loves us, Jesus loves us, right? And because of this great love, right, we accept him as our Lord and Savior, right? We submit to him and we're transformed, right? That's the, the gospel message is, is that his great love has provided us a way for reconciliation and we are transformed by this great love, right? And I think a lot of times when we read scripture, then also coming into the text that we're going to be looking at this week, we, we, we feel a lot of like rules, right? We feel a lot of rules and shoulds. We should do this, we should do that, right? But it really comes down to his great love for us. You know, just like um, a, a parent loving a child, right? They provide these rules and, and, and these things you should do and constantly instructing and guiding because of what? Because of a great love for their child, right? They want their child to, to do what's right and to be the best that they can be. And so that's what we see in Scripture. And that's what we have to understand um, with God. You know, he loves us greatly. <clears throat> and so he gives us, because of his great love, he gives us guidance and instruction on basically all facets of life, right? All facets of life. Doesn't it tell you what shoes to wear this morning, right, Sally? You won't find what shoes to wear in, in the Scripture this morning. But he gives you guidance on all types of things, even dress, right? All right, so this week we're going to be in Romans chapter 13. Uh, last week we we're in Romans chapter 12, and we're going to do kind of the same format um, as last week. This week in chapter 13, we're going to see a couple things. We're going to see uh, obey authority, especially governing authority, except when it tells you to go against God, right? We'll see that in this text. We'll see second that love fulfills the law, right? Ultimately, we saw that with Christ on the cross. And then us loving others, treating others well, fulfills the law, right? And then three, we see time is running out. Nobody's getting younger today than yesterday, right? Anybody getting younger today? No, any Benjamin Buttons in here? No, right? Time is running out. So let's take a look at Romans chapter 13, first couple verses. I think we'll do one to four first. It says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right. But for those who do wrong, do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. There are God's, they are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, if it is necessary to submit to authorities... Not only because it is necessary to submit to authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time, who give their full time to governing the word of God. All right. So in verses one to six, we see that government should, right? This is what government should do. Uphold good. Verse three, do what is right and you will be commended, right? They, they want to uphold good. They should punish evil, right? Verse 4 said, God's servants, they're agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. And then three, they see that uh, government should be servants of God, right? Servants of, of what is right with God. Verse 6, authorities are God's servants, right? And we also see in this text, we should submit to government. Verse 5, it is necessary to submit to the authorities. And second, pay taxes, right? This is also why you pay taxes, all right? So we see these five things and what should happen, right? This is general, right? They're very general. This is what should happen, right? So let's like, take a look. Verse one, government is established by God with God's authority, right? Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. There is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God, right? This is a hard text. Right, when we look at all authorities, it says all authorities, right? There's none that, has, that comes into power except which is established by God, right? God uses different things, you know, all for his good and his glory. 
And we all will admit that there are bad authorities, right? And that, that some horrible things happen with governing authorities. So we're going to get to that question, right, later on what you do in those type of circumstances. But Scripture tells us God is sovereign. God is fully in control, right? He is in control, and he has established all authorities, right? It says, verse 2, it says, Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, right? It's, it, it doesn't say it's rebelling against God, right? It's a rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves, right? Rebellion against authorities does come with judgment, right? Right or wrong judgment, right? We see that in verse 2. Verse 3 says, For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. Right? Now, in Scripture, there's, there's Scripture is God's word, and it's absolute truth. Right? But parts of Scripture give general truths, right? Um, of saying this is, and so this is like saying this is what should happen, right? This is what authorities should do, right? Authority, right, for rulers hold no terror for those who do right. But we know in government and in authorities, there's been parts of life where people in authority do hold terror for people who, who do what is right and good, right? So this is saying this is what should transpire in Scripture, right? And we see here in the military, anybody who's been in the military, knows, you know, you do what is right, you're not going to get um, uh, in, in trouble, right? Uh, a good dog, you know, the, the dog does what's right, they're not going to get in trouble. So generally good authority and government um, uh, has no terror, the, the, has no um, persecution of those who do right, but only for those who do wrong, right? And that's what scripture is teaching. Verse 4, it says, for the one in authority is God's servant, Right? For your good, but if you do wrong, be afraid, right? And so th we also have to remember the context of which Romans is written at. In this period of time, um, the Roman leaders were not persecuting the church to the degree which transpired later, right? Um, there was persecution, but the government itself was not going to stomp out Christianity like happened uh, so Romans is about 50 A.D. In 70 A.D., you know, things dramatically changed in leadership, right? So we got to look at the context as well in which this is written. And it says, there are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer, right? So we're talking about the exact context of what's happening at that exact period of time, right? And then also what they should be doing. And it says, therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter, matter of conscience, right? We all need to be um, submissive, right, to the ultimate authorities of God, and, and government is supposed to um, be servants of God, right? So we need to, to submit to them, and that's why it says, uh, this is also why you pay taxes for their God's servants, and they give their full-time governing, right? So these are all the things that should be happening in good government, in good parts um, when, when things are functioning well, we see all these things taking place, right? And that is what our, our duty as people are to do, right? And honestly, so often, um, it, it, you know, we feel as uh, rebellion or going against, right? And, and we're, in our country, we're so blessed to be able to speak out against government and engage government and say what is right and wrong. So we're not actually disobeying authority, Right? We're, not, we're not going against what the government says if we say X, Y, or Z is wrong. Right? We have that freedom of speech here in our country. Right? So that's not a rebellion against authority here in the U.S. In other countries, that might be a rebellion against authority. And also, oftentimes, governments will change, leaders will change. In our individual life, nothing has substantially changed. Right? From a, a, especially here in the United States, our, our freedoms and our abilities and the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis has not dramatically changed from one, from one president to the next, right? Gas prices might go up, other things might go up, but our freedoms and other things are in place, right? So, so overall, we're called to be submissive to authority, right? So we see 
Government should do these things, uphold good, punish evil, be servants of God, and we should submit to government and pay taxes, right? But the question is, do we ever disobey government, right? Do we ever disobey the authorities that be? And there's a scriptural basis for saying, yes, there are times when we do that, right? In Acts chapter 5, uh, verses 28 and 29, here Peter is brought before the authorities, right, the Jewish leaders, and they said, we give you strict orders not to teach in his name, right? We gave you strict orders not to teach in Jesus' name, right? So these are the, the authorities, right, the governing bodies saying, don't teach in Jesus' name. But Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings, right? So in the context where government is telling you to go against the, the things of God, what God is telling you to do, then you're supposed to obey the ultimate authority, which is God, right? Because government is supposed to be what? Servants of God, right? So if they're not being servants of God, if they're telling you to go against what God has commanded you to do, it doesn't mean that government needs to be Christians or whatever the case is, but if they're directly telling you to go against God, what God has called you to do, Scripture, the Bible teaches you, in those cases, you rebel against authority, right? In Daniel chapter 6, the king made a law that said for the next 30 days, no one could pray to any god except him, right? Except for the king. And then if they prayed to any god except for the king, they'd be thrown into the lion's den, right? So now, Daniel, right, being a godly man, being a man of faith, right, is he supposed to pray to a person? Does anyone know? Is Daniel supposed to pray to a person? No. All right, so what does Daniel do, right? Even though Daniel heard about the new law, he still went to his house and he prayed to God, right? So if government is then, it gets to a time and a place where government is telling us that we should go against what God has commanded us. We follow who? We follow, uh, who do we follow? Maritza, who do we follow? Right, right? So we follow God, right? So, you know, just clarity generally, right? Government is supposed to do a couple things, right? They're supposed to uphold good. They're supposed to punish evil. They're supposed to serve God, right? That, that are the core functions of what governing authorities should do. We as people, we should submit to government, right? It's not just when we want to, right? Overall, we need to submit to government. We need to, to, to support government right? Except when it's telling us to directly go against what God has called us to do. Amen? All right. Verse 7, it says, give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Amen. Right? Verse 7, right? What are we supposed to do? Pay up, right? He talked about just previously paying up to paying your taxes, but also pay up on all the things you do. You know, who, who should we respect? We should treat all people with dignity and respect, right? It's saying pay up. If, if we're supposed to pay somebody, pay them. Don't withhold wages, right? If we're supposed to respect people, then give respect, right? We're supposed to give honor, then give honor. We're supposed to uh, uh, be people, that do the right things, right? That we see here in, text, in, in the text that God is calling us to respect, to honor, and to do what is right, right? Love verse 8, it says, Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law, right? So one, if you owe anybody anything, right? Don't let that debt remain outstanding, but pay the debt right? But there's a continuing debt. There's a black hole that you will never fill, right? And what is that? It's to love one another, right? 
You can never check that box in your life. Continually throughout your life, you're supposed to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law, right? Jesus Christ, by his love for us, right, him dying for our sins, has fulfilled the law, right? He fulfilled the law. And thus, us as followers of Jesus, when we love others, right, when we do what is right by God, we fulfill the law. But that doesn't end. There will be no period in time where I have loved my kids enough that it's done, right? I will always have to do that. And that has to do with every other person. One of the things that hit me earlier on in my Christian walk, especially when we just had kids, right? You, you, you have kids, and I'll tell you, I'm not a very emotional guy. But when I held my kids for the first time after they're born, I swear I almost fell apart, right? Just like the, the emotion that, that runs through me and that love for them, I almost fell apart, right? And that same type of, of, of love and emotion that uh, is what God has for us. And one of the things that really just hit me like a ton of bricks when I think Zach was just a couple years old and I was just so focused on it. And then J.D. was born, I was focused on them, right? And I just wanted to pour my entire life for them. And then the realization came that God loves people I hate, right? People I dislike as much as my kids, right? To, to God, they are just as important, right, as my own kids, right? And so the way I need to live, right, I, God has entrusted them to me. God has entrusted certain people to all of us, so we need to pour into them and make sure we don't neglect them, right? One of the things, um, uh, I, I think a great travesty in, in, in the pastorate, in the missions field, is so often people put their families on the altar. They'll say, hey, look, it's, all, it's so important that I serve these other people that they don't care for their own families. They don't, they're not there for their own families. Like, you know, and there's horrible stories. There's a story about Billy Graham going to see his, I think, three- or four-year-old son, and his, his son didn't know who he was. He, he didn't know who he was. I said, we're going to see your dad. He gets in the room, and he didn't know who his dad was because he was on the road so much traveling, right? Now, God used that, and, and, and praise God, I believe his son is, is following Jesus, right? But I said, I'm never going to put my kids on the altar. But knowing that God cares about other people, right? The most vile person just as much as he cares about my kids, right? So I need to balance my life, right? I can't pour everything in here and disregard everywhere else, but I can't pour everything somewhere else, right? We need to have balance and we need to understand, right, that this, this call to love one another is never fulfilled, right? It's never fulfilled. We have to constantly be doing that and loving other people just as much as, not, you know, some people don't love their kids, right? Let's be honest. Some people don't love their kids, but just as much as we love ourselves, right? Just as much as we love ourselves, right? And that's what we see in the next text. It says, the commands, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not commit murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, are summed up in this. Love your neighbor as you love yourself, right? Now, some people will say, oh, I love my neighbor, just leave me alone. I want people to leave me alone. So just, I'll leave them alone, right? Just, just stay away from me. I'm not going to tell anybody anything because it'd be unloving to tell them something wrong, right? Or a problem, right? So I wanted to, to bring some other scripture in to kind of fill out that picture. Proverbs 19.8, it says, whoever gets sense, right? Whoever gets wisdom loves his own soul. Whoever keeps understanding will discover good, right? So, Getting knowledge and understanding is loving yourself, right? Loving yourself, right? Ephesians 5.29 says, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. And it's talking about husbands loving your wives as if they're your own flesh in that text specifically. But it says no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, right? So if you're going to love your neighbor, if you're going to love other people, as you love yourself, and the parable of the Good Samaritan tells us, who is our neighbor? Everyone, right? Even the most vile person, even the most vile person, because Jews looked at Samaritans as if they were worse than dirt, right? So even though the, the person, they, everyone is our neighbor, right? 
We cannot get around that. Everyone is our neighbor. So what do we do if we want to love others as we love ourselves? First, we give them sense and wisdom, right? We give them sense and wisdom. There's people who have loved ones that are doing horrible things and they never want to say anything, right? Or they're living lives that they shouldn't live and they're doing things that they shouldn't do, right? But they never say anything because they don't want to upset them, right? Now, there's a way you can say things, right? There's definitely a way you can say things. You, 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 you also have to uh, try to earn respect, right? You have to earn the right to talk into somebody's life, right? If you're just somebody who's always mean and nasty and judging and constantly, constantly putting somebody else down, that's not going to be received very well, right? You wouldn't want that for yourself, right? You would want somebody to show love and care for you. Because once they show love and care, you understand where they're coming from is from a position of good, right? That's what you would want, right? But you need to share wisdom, right? You need to share wisdom. When people are doing things that could be detrimental to themselves, if people are, are being pulled farther and farther away from Christ or, or Christian community or the church, through relationships or activities or anything else, right? You being, a posi- being in a position of hopefully love and, and, and respected in their life will share these things, right? In a loving way. Why are you going to share these things? Why are you going to share that people shouldn't do certain stuff? Because you what? Because you what? Because you love them, right? You love them. And do it in a gentle way. Hey, look, and if they don't accept it, it's okay. You don't have to be angry at them and hate them and stop talking to them. You can just be like, hey, move on. Continue to love them. Continue to care for them. Continue to respect them, right? But do it. Give them sense. Give them wisdom. Who else is going to do it if you don't do it? Who else is going to do it if we don't do it? Who else is going to do it? Nobody loves them as much as you, hopefully, right? Hopefully, You're the person in their life, they're like, man, I know that person loves me. I know if I call Charles in the middle of the night, he's going to come, right? And if I tell him something, hopefully that means something, right? And it says it nourishes and cherishes, right? That's such beautiful language, right, of how to love others. Nourish and cherish them. Value them as a person, even when they're doing some stuff they shouldn't do. You cherish them. They're valuable. You nourish them. You feed them. You support them, right? And good things, obviously, but you got to give them that sense and that wisdom, right? That's how you love others as you love yourself, right? Too, too, it's too easy to cut things off with people, right? It's just too easy to cut things off because people are messy, right? And they take time and energy. And so often it's just like, oh, I'm done with them. I tried. I tried. Anybody ever felt like that before? I tried. I'm done. Right? I tried. I'm done. But love them as you love yourself. Right? Give them wisdom and sense and nourish and cherish. Right? Nourish and cherish. Now, caveat, there are boundaries. Right? There are boundaries. Sometimes people are doing some really bad stuff. Right? And you can't do anything. And you can't ultimately you know, get caught up in something like that, right? Like, you know, I have people who run the streets still, right? They're involved with illegal activity and drugs. And if they called me to come to a certain place at a certain time to give them a ride, I'm probably not going, right? Right? That's just wisdom right there. Right, Will? Am I right? I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go. But I still love them. I care for them. I give them wisdom and sense. And I cherish them, right? Cherish them as people. So that's who Jesus is, right? That's who Jesus is. Verse 10, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law, right? That's who Christ is, the fulfillment of the law, right? All these laws, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not commit murder. You shall not covet, right? All these things are fulfilled in love, right? They're fulfilled in love. Christ's love on the cross, first and foremost, and then in and through us, right? Verse 11, it says, and do this, 
understanding the present time, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber. Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with Lord Jesus Christ. And do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Amen. Right? Amen. Where is all this coming from? It's coming from love. God's love for us and his care for us, right? Verse 11, it says, wake up, right? Wake up. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber. You know, a lot of times it's easy to get into a slumber, right? As Christians, a lot of times we become energized and on fire for God, but then we get back into a slumber, right? We fall asleep. We take a nap, right? So you're saying, wake up, right? Your salvation is nearer now than when we first believed, right? And when he's talking about salvation, one, salvation comes through Christ Jesus. But ultimately, our salvation, we are fully saved from the, the perils of this earth at death, right? At death, when all this is over, right? And when all this is over, we are saved at death. He's saying, hey, wake up. Time is ticking. It's coming, right? Your time is almost running out. Your time is almost running out. The night is nearly over. The day, right? The, the, the day when we are in the presence of the Lord is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light, right? And what is that for? Our own goodness. The deeds of darkness are not for our own good, right? They're not for our own good. They don't help us, right? They, they, they don't improve our life, right? They are temporary things that have eternal consequences, negative consequences, right? And so I say, hey, look, put away the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Come to God. Your time is running out. Do things for the Lord. Live a life that has purpose and meaning, right? Don't waste your time, right? Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness and not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy, right? Don't waste your time with the, the, the things of the flesh, the things of the earth, right? Be focused on God, right? Follow God, the ultimate fulfillment, right? Last week, mentioned uh, briefly John Piper in his ministry, I know where he calls Christian hedonism, right? He says, as we're pursuing God and we're, we're filling ourselves with things of the Lord and we're constantly seeking after Jesus, we have full fulfillment, right? None of these things give you full fulfillment, right? They're all temporary fixes, right? All temporary fixes that people are trying to seek pleasure, right? Or seek, seek escape. But in Jesus, we have ultimate pleasure, and we have ultimate fulfillment. There's nothing to escape, right? We are fulfilled, right? So say, don't waste your time on these things. It says, rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh, right? Focus yourself on God. Focus yourself on Christ. Make the most of every minute, right? most of every minute. There's been plenty of times and plenty of things that we've gone through in our, in our lives as a family where it becomes really clear to us that all of this just fades away, right? All of this fades away and it's going to be over. And the only thing that matters at the end of it all is the things that you have done for eternity, right? The things you have done for God, right? Ultimately, the things you have done for Lord Jesus Christ, right? The fulfillment of all things, the fulfillment of the law is love, right? So in Romans 13, we see obey authority except when it tells you to go against God. We see that love fulfills the law, right? And we also saw what love is, right? It's not just leaving people alone. It's not just 
doing nice for thing, doing nice things for people, but it's all it's speaking into their life, right? Nourishing them, cherishing them, and also giving them wisdom, right? If you know somebody who's doing something that's ungodly in their life, right? Earn their respect, nourish them, cherish them. I'm not saying not to be in relationship, but tell them the truth. If you don't, that's on you. That's your sin, right? And if you're not, if you're not giving somebody wisdom, right, on what God is calling to do, on how their life would be better, right, in Christ, who is your priority? Are people, or, or is your comfort a priority? Sometimes people don't say stuff to other people because they don't want to be discomforted, right? They don't want to have tension in their life, so they do it for selfish reasons. Right? Sometimes people don't say things to other people because they're scared the other person won't like them. Right? They're scared about, oh man, I don't want to cause any problems or issues. I don't want to do that. They might not talk to me anymore, and I really like talking to this person. Right? Sometimes they don't do it for that reason. Right? And there's a couple other reasons why people ultimately don't show love to others as they love their self. Right? But we see that love fulfills the law. And if we want to be like Christ. If we're going to follow Christ, we love our neighbors. We love others as we love ourselves. And your time is running out. And not only is your time running out, the time is running out in people's life around you. There are people that you will never see again, right? Whatever reason, right? Things or something will happen. Maybe it's somebody you don't see that often, but you really like, you really love, you really care for. You might think that you had more time with them because they're young or whatever the case is. But honestly, you will never see them again. Circumstances will transpire where that person passes away or you could be the one that passes away. I'll tell you a story, and I've shared this before. It's been a while. I had a cousin who died in his 30s. We had a family party. And um, at the family party, when we got, when we were saying goodbye, I got really emotional, right? I didn't let it out, but I felt something inside of me. And I was like, hey, we really got to get together. We really got to get together. He's like, yeah, yeah, I'm going on vacation, and we'll get together when we get back. He goes on vacation, and he drowned. He died. Unexpectedly, great shape. Dude was in fantastic shape. He drowned. Never saw him again. I, he, young, healthy guy in his 30s. I would have never thought that way. I would have never seen him again. But that happens. Lee, I hope you don't mind me sharing, but Lee had a coworker who passed away this past week. Last time Lee talked to that coworker, I'm sure you never thought that was going to be the last time you spoke to them. Time is running out for you and for other people. Right? Live for Christ. Fulfill God's law, right, by loving others, sharing Christ with others, and being the hands and feet of Jesus in others' life. If you don't share, who else will? Who else will? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for your word that gives us wisdom beyond all measure, O oh Lord. We pray that we can never be so uh, foolish or arrogant, O oh Lord, that we can cherry pick scriptures and say this is exactly what we're supposed to do. But um, instead, just be students of your word, be humble, and constantly seek after you to have a full understanding of what you desire in us, O oh Lord, what you desire from us, O oh God. We pray, O oh Lord, that we can be obedient. We cannot just focus on the, the, the caveats, uh, uh, the exceptions where we can be disobedient to authorities, but we will take wholeheartedly your word and your scripture to be obedient, O oh Lord. Now we pray, O oh Lord, for this country and the freedom and blessing we have here. And we pray that we will exercise our freedom to speak truth and light and goodness into our government, into our neighbors, into our uh, co-workers, into our families, into every aspect of our life, O oh Lord. That we will truly love our neighbor. We will love everyone as we love ourselves, O oh Lord. And pray, O oh Lord, that we could just be your hands and feet, O oh Lord. Well, first, uh, to each other. Um, we could be a, a community that nourishes and cherishes one another, O oh Lord. We can also be a community that's constantly seeking your wisdom, your growth, 
And we pray, oh Lord, I pray for, for people here today who have folks in their life that love them, respect them, admire them, but have, have stopped from saying the things of God to other people, from truly loving that person as they should by sharing wisdom, sharing godly wisdom and godly advice, oh Lord. I pray that each and every one of us, and specifically the ones who have not done that, can have the courage and the boldness to do so. And I pray that those words are received well, that they're given well, they're given well, they're giving in, in, in love and nourishment, and they're received well, O oh Lord. And each and every one of us has that. We, we have that, we will have it, and we've had that. And each and every one of us has made mistakes in that regard, O oh Lord. And I pray that moving forward, we can do better so that your kingdom can grow and we could be obedient to you and follow our Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as we...